A Point Death by Agatha Christie Audiobook 10x11 No more do I. Poirot looked from one to the other of them. You do not, not, eh? A servant was sent. Why a servant? Were you not, all of you, most assiduous in your attendance on the old lady as a general rule? Did not one or another of you always escort her to meals? She was infirm. It was difficult for her to rise from a chair without assistance. Always one or another of you was at her elbow. I suggest then, that on dinner being announced, the natural thing would have been for one or another of her family to go out and help her. But not one of you offered to do so. You all sat there, paralyzed, watching each other, wondering perhaps, why no one went. Nadine said sharply. All this is absurd, M. Poirot. We were all tired that evening. We ought to have gone, I admit, but on that evening we just didn't. Precisely precisely on that particular evening. You, madam, did perhaps more waiting on her than anyone else. It was one of the duties that you accepted mechanically. But that evening you did not offer to go out to help her in. Why? That is what I asked myself why? And I tell you my answer. Because you knew quite well that she was dead. No, no, do not interrupt me, madam. He raised an impassioned hand. You will now listen to me Hirul Poirot. There were witnesses to your conversation with your mother-in-law. Witnesses who could see but who could not hear. Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce were a long way off. They saw you apparently having a conversation with your mother-in-law, but what actual evidence is there of what occurred? I will propound to you instead a little theory. You have brains, madam. If in your quiet, unheard fashion you have decided on shall we say the elimination of your husband's mother, you will carry it out with intelligence and with due preparation. You have access to drive. Gerard's tent during his absence on the morning excursion. You are fairly sure that you will find a suitable drug. Your nursing training helps you there. You choose digitoxin the same kind of drug that the old lady is taking. You also take his hypodermic syringe since, to your annoyance, your own has disappeared. You hope to replace the latter before the doctor notices its absence. Before proceeding to carry out your plan, you make one last attempt to stir your husband into action. You tell him of your intention to marry Jefferson Cope. Though your husband is terribly upset, he does not react as you had hoped so you are forced to put your plan of murder into action. You return to the camp, exchanging a pleasant natural word with Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce as you pass. You go up to where your mother-in-law is sitting. You have the syringe with the drug in it ready. It is easy to seize her wrist and proficient as you are with your nurse's training force home the plunger. It is done before your mother-in-law realizes what you are doing. From far down the valley the others only see you talking to her, bending over her. Then, deliberately, you go and fetch a chair and sit there, apparently engaged in an amicable conversation for some minutes. Death must have been almost instantaneous. It is a dead woman to whom you sit talking, but who shall guess that? Then you put away the chair and go down to the marquee where you find your husband reading a book. And you are careful not to leave that marquee. MRS. Boynton's death, you are sure, will be put down to heart trouble. It will, indeed, be due to heart trouble. In only one thing have your plans gone astray. You cannot return the syringe to drive. Gerard's tent because the doctor is in there shivering with malaria and although you do not know it, he has already missed the syringe. That, madam, was the flaw in an otherwise perfect crime. There was silence a moment's dead silence then Lennox Boynton sprang to his feet. No. He shouted. That's a damned lie. Nadine did nothing. She couldn't have done anything. 
My mother my mother was already dead. Ah! Poirot's eyes came gently around to him. So, after all, it was you who killed her, M. Boynton. Again a moment's pause then Lennox dropped back into his chair and raised trembling hands to his face. Yes that's right I killed her. You took the digitoxin from Drive. Gerard's tent. Yes. When? As as you said in the morning. And the syringe. The syringe? Yes. Why did you kill her? Can you ask? I am asking, M. Boynton. But you know my wife was leaving me with Cope yes, but you only learned that in the afternoon. Lennox stared at him. Of course. When we were out but you took the poison and the syringe in the morning before you knew. Why the hell do you badger me with questions? He paused and passed a shaking hand across his forehead. What does it matter, anyway? It matters a great deal. I advise you, M. Lennox Boynton, to tell me the truth. The truth. Lennox stared at him. Nadine suddenly turned abruptly in her chair and gazed into her husband's face. That is what I said the truth. By God, I will, said Lennox suddenly. But I don't know whether you will believe me. He drew a deep breath. That afternoon, when I left Nadine, I was absolutely all to pieces. I'd never dreamed she'd go from me to someone else. I was I was nearly mad. I felt as though I was drunk or recovering from a bad illness. Poirot nodded. He said. I noted Lady Westholm's description of your gate when you passed her. That is why I knew your wife was not speaking the truth when she said she told you after you were both back at the camp. Continue, M. Boynton. I hardly knew what I was doing. But as I got near, my brain seemed to clear. It flashed over me that I had only myself to blame. I'd been a miserable worm. I ought to have defied my stepmother and cleared out years ago. And it came to me that it mightn't be too late even now. There she was, the old devil, sitting up like an obscene idol against the red cliffs. I went right up to have it out with her. I meant to tell her just what I thought and to announce that I was clearing out. I had a wild idea I might get away at once that evening clear out with Nadine and get as far as Ma in any way that night. Oh, Lennox my dear it was a long soft sigh. He went on. And then, my God you could have struck me down with a touch. She was dead. Sitting there dead. I I didn't know what to do. I was dumb dazed. Everything I was going to shout out at her bottled up inside me turning to lead I can't explain. Stone that's what it felt like being turned to stone. I did something mechanically. I picked up her wristwatch, it was lying in her lap, and put it around her wrist her horrid, limp, dead wrist. He shuddered. God. It was awful. Then I stumbled down, went into the marquee. I ought to have called someone, I suppose but I couldn't. I just sat there, turning the page sweating. He stopped. You won't believe that you can't. Why didn't I call someone? Tell Nadine? I don't know. Drive. Gerard cleared his throat. Your statement is perfectly plausible, M. Boynton, he said. You were in a bad nervous condition. Two severe shocks administered in rapid succession would be quite enough to put you in the condition you have described it as the Weissenhalter reaction best exemplified in the case of a bird that has dashed its head against a window. Even after its recovery it refrains instinctively from all action giving itself time to readjust the nerve centers. I do not express myself well in English, but what I mean is this. You could not have acted any other way. Any decisive action of any kind would have been quite impossible for you. You passed through a period of mental paralysis. 
he turned to Poirot. I assure you, my friend, that is so. Oh, I do not doubt it, said Poirot. There was a little fact I had already noted the fact that M. Boynton had replaced his mother's wristwatch. That was capable of two explanations it might have been a cover for the actual deed, or it might have been observed and misinterpreted by young M.R.S. Boynton. She returned only five minutes after her husband. She must therefore have seen that action. When she got up to her mother-in-law and found her dead, with the mark of a hypodermic syringe on her wrist, she would naturally jump to the conclusion that her husband had committed the deed that her announcement of her decision to leave him had produced a reaction in him different from that for which she had hoped. Briefly, Nadine Boynton believed that she had inspired her husband to commit murder. He looked at Nadine. That is so, madam. She bowed her head. Then she asked. Did you really suspect me, M. Poirot? I thought you were a possibility, madam. She leaned forward. And now? What really happened, M. Poirot? Seventeen what really happened? Poirot repeated. He reached behind him, drew forward a chair and sat down. His manner was now friendly and formal. It is a question is it not? For the digitoxin was taken, the syringe was missing. There was the mark of a hypodermic on MRS. Boynton's wrist. It is true that in a few days' time we shall know definitely the autopsy will tell us whether MRS. Boynton died of an overdose of digitalis or not. But then it may be too late. It would be better to reach the truth tonight while the murderer is here under our hand. Nadine raised her head sharply. You mean that you still believe that one of us here in this room her voice died away? Poirot was slowly nodding to himself. The truth that is what I promised Colonel Carberry. And so, having cleared our path we are back again where I was earlier in the day, writing down a list of printed facts and being faced straight away with two glaring inconsistencies. Colonel Carberry spoke for the first time. Suppose, now, we hear what they are. He suggested. Poirot said with dignity. I am about to tell you. We will take once more those first two facts on my list. MRS. Boynton was taking a mixture of digitalis and drive. Gerard missed a hypodermic syringe. Take those facts and set them against the undeniable fact with which I was immediately confronted that the Boynton family showed unmistakably guilty reactions. It would seem therefore certain that one of the Boynton family must have committed the crime. And yet those two facts I mentioned were all against that theory. For, see you, to take a concentrated solution of digitalis that, yes, it is a clever idea, because MRS. Boynton was already taking the drug. But what would a member of her family do then? Ah, ma foi. There was only one sensible thing to do. Put the poison into her bottle of medicine. That is what anyone anyone with a grain of sense and who had access to the medicine would certainly do. Sooner or later MRS. Boynton takes a dose and dies and even if the digitoxin is discovered in the bottle it may be set down as a mistake of the chemist who made it up. Certainly nothing can be proved. Why, then, the theft of the hypodermic needle? There can be only two explanations of that. Either drive. Gerard overlooked the syringe and it was never stolen, or else the syringe was taken because the murderer had not got access to the medicine that is to say, the murderer was not a member of the Boynton family. The two first facts point overwhelmingly to an outsider as having committed the crime. I saw that but I was puzzled, as I say, by the strong evidences of guilt displayed by the Boynton family. Was it possible that, in spite of that consciousness of guilt, the Boventons were innocent? I set out to prove, not the guilt, but the innocence of those people. That is where we stand now. 
the murder was committed by an outsider that is, by someone who was not sufficiently intimate with MRS. Boynton to enter her tent or to handle her medicine bottle. He paused. There are three people in this room who are, technically, outsiders, but who have a definite connection with the case. M. Cope whom we will consider first, has been closely associated with the Boynton family for some time. Can we discover motive and opportunity on his part? It seems not. MRS. Boynton's death has affected him adversely since it has brought about the frustration of certain hopes. Unless M. Cope's motive was an almost fanatical desire to benefit others, we can find no reason for his desiring MRS. Boynton's death. Unless, of course, there is a motive about which we are entirely in the dark. We do not know exactly what M. Cope's dealings with the Boynton family have been. Mr. Cope said, with dignity. This seems to me a little far-fetched, M. Poirot. You must remember, I had absolutely no opportunity for committing this deed, and in any case. I hold very strong views as to the sanctity of human life. Your position certainly seems impeccable, said Poirot with gravity. In a work of fiction you would be strongly suspected on that account. He turned a little in his chair. We now come to Miss King. Miss King had a certain amount of motive and she had the necessary medical knowledge and is a person of character and determination, but since she left the camp before 3.30 with the others and did not return to it until 6 o'clock, it seems difficult to see where she could have had an opportunity. Next we must consider drive. Gerard. Now, here we must take into account the actual time that the murder was committed. According to M. Lennox Boynton's last statement, his mother was dead at 4.35. According to Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce she was alive at 4.15, when they started on their walk. That leaves exactly 20 minutes unaccounted for. Now, as these two ladies walked away from the camp drive, Gerard passed them going to it. There is no one to say what drive. Gerard's movements were when he reached the camp because the two ladies' backs were towards it. They were walking away from it. Therefore it is perfectly possible for Drive. Gerard to have committed the crime. Being a doctor, he could easily counterfeit the appearance of malaria. There is, I should say, a possible motive. Drive. Gerard might have wished to save a certain person whose reason, perhaps more vital a loss than a loss of life, was in danger and he may have considered the sacrifice of an old and worn-out life worth it. Your ideas, said Drive. Gerard, are fantastic. He smiled amiably. Without taking any notice, Poirot went on. But if so, why did Gerard call attention to the possibility of foul play? It is quite certain that, but for his statement to Colonel Carberry, MRS. Boynton's death would have been put down to natural causes. It was Drive. Gerard who first pointed out the possibility of murder. That, my friends, said Poirot, does not make common sense. Doesn't seem to, said Colonel Carberry gruffly. He looked curiously at Poirot. There is one more possibility, said Poirot. MRS. Lennox Boynton just now negated strongly the possibility of her young sister-in-law being guilty. The force of her objection lay in the fact that she knew her mother-in-law to be dead at the time. But remember this. Ginevra Boynton was at the camp all the afternoon. And there was a moment a moment when Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce were walking away from the camp and before drive. Gerard had returned to it. Ginevra stirred. She leaned forward, staring into Poirot's face with a strange, innocent, puzzled stare. I did it. You think I did it. Then suddenly, with a movement of swift, incomparable beauty, 
she was up from her chair and had flung herself across the room and down on her knees beside Drive. Gerard, clinging to him, gazing up passionately into his face. No. No. Don't let them say it. They're making the walls close around me again. It's not true. I never did anything. They are my enemies they want to put me in prison to shut me up. You must help me. You must help me. There, there, my child. Gently the doctor patted her head. Then he addressed Poirot. What you say is nonsense absurd. Delusions of persecution. Murmured Poirot. Yes but she could never have done it that way. She would have done it, you must perceive, dramatically a dagger, something flamboyant, spectacular never this cool, calm logic. I tell you, my friends, it is so. This was a reasoned crime a sane crime. Poirot smiled. Unexpectedly he bowed. J.E. Sui's entierment de Votrievis, he said smoothly. Eighteen come, said Hercule Poirot. We have still a little way to go. Drive. Gerard has invoked the psychology. So let us now examine the psychological side of the case. We have taken the facts, we have established a chronological sequence of events, we have heard the evidence. There remains the psychology. And the most important psychological evidence concerns the dead woman. It is the psychology of MRS. Boynton herself that is the most important thing in this case. Take from my list of specified facts points 3 and 4. MRS. Boynton took definite pleasure in keeping her family from enjoying themselves with other people. MRS. Boynton, on the afternoon in question, encouraged her family to go away and leave her. These two facts, they contradict each other flatly. Why, on this particular afternoon, should MRS. Boynton suddenly display a complete reversal of her usual policy? Was it that she felt a sudden warmth of the heart and instinct of benevolence? That, it seems to me from all I have heard, was extremely unlikely. Yet there must have been a reason. What was that reason? Let us examine closely the character of MRS. Boynton. There have been many different accounts of her. She was a tyrannical old martinet, she was a mental sadist, she was an incarnation of evil, she was crazy. Which of these views is the true one? I think myself that Sarah King came nearest to the truth when in a flash of inspiration in Jerusalem she saw the old lady as intensely pathetic. But not only pathetic feudal. Let us, if we can, think ourselves into the mental condition of MRS. Boynton. A human creature born with immense ambition, with a yearning to dominate and to impress her personality on other people. She neither sublimated that intense craving for power nor did she seek to master it. No, mess dames and messers, she fed it. But in the end listen well to this in the end, what did it amount to? She was not a great power. She was not feared and hated over a wide area. She was the petty tyrant of one isolated family. And as drive. Gerard said to me she became bored like any other old lady with her hobby and she sought to extend her activities and to amuse herself by making her dominance more precarious. But that led to an entirely different aspect of the case. By coming abroad, she realized for the first time how extremely insignificant she was. And now we come directly to point number 10 the words spoken to Sarah King in Jerusalem. Sarah King, you see, had put her finger on the truth. She had revealed fully and uncompromisingly the pitiful futility of MRS. Boynton's scheme of existence. And now listen very carefully all of you to what her exact words to Miss King were. Miss King has said that MRS. Boynton spoke so malevolently not even looking at me. And this is what she actually said. I've never forgotten anything, not an action, 
not a name, not a face. Those words made a great impression on Miss King. Their extraordinary intensity and the loud hoarse tone in which they were uttered. So strong was the impression they left on her mind I think that she quite failed to realize their extraordinary significance. Do you see that significance, any of you? He waited a minute. It seems not. But, Miss Amos, does it escape you that those words were not a reasonable answer at all to what Miss King had just been saying? I've never forgotten anything, not an action, not a name, not a face. It does not make sense. If she had said. I never forget impertinence something of that kind but no a face is what she said. Ah! Cried Poirot, beating his hands together. But it leaps to the eye. Those words, ostensibly spoken to Miss King, were not meant for Miss King at all. They were addressed to someone else standing behind Miss King. He paused, noting their expressions. Yes, it leaps to the eye. That was, I tell you, a psychological moment in MRS. Boynton's life. She had been exposed to herself by an intelligent young woman. She was full of baffled fury and at that moment she recognized someone a face from the past a victim delivered bound into her hands. We are back, you see, to the outsider. And now the meaning of MRS. Boynton's unexpected amiability on the afternoon of her death is clear. She wanted to get rid of her family because to use a vulgarity she had other fish to fry. She wanted the field left clear for an interview with a new victim. Now, from that new standpoint, let us consider the events of the afternoon. The Boynton family goes off. MRS. Boynton sits up by her cave. Now, let us consider very carefully the evidence of Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce. The latter is an unreliable witness, she is unobservant and very suggestible. Lady Westholm, on the other hand, is perfectly clear as to her facts and meticulously observant. Both ladies agree on one fact. An Arab, one of the servants, approaches MRS. Boynton, angers her in some way and retires hastily. Lady Westholm states definitely that the servant had first been into the tent occupied by Ginevra Boynton but you may remember that drive. Gerard's tent was next door to Ginevra's. It is possible that it was drive. Gerard's tent the Arab entered. Colonel Carberry said. Do you mean to tell me that one of those Bedouin fellows of mine murdered an old lady by sticking her with a hypodermic? Fantastic. Wait. Colonel Carberry, I have not yet finished. Let us agree that the Arab might have come from Drive. Gerard's tent and not Ginevra Boynton's. What is the next thing? Both ladies agree that they could not see his face clearly enough to identify him and that they did not hear what was said. That is understandable. The distance between the marquee and the ledge is about 200 yards. Lady Westholm gave a clear description of the man otherwise, describing in detail his ragged breeches and the untidiness with which his putties were rolled. Poirot leaned forward. And that, my friends, was very odd indeed. Because, if she could not see his face or hear what was said, she could not possibly have noticed the state of his breeches and putties. Not at two hundred yards. It was an error that, you see. It suggested a curious idea to me. Why insist so on the ragged breeches and untidy putties? Could it be because the breeches were not torn and the putties were non-existent? Lady Westholm and Miss Pierce both saw the man but from where they were sitting they could not see each other. That is shown by the fact that Lady Westholm came to see if Miss Pierce was awake and found her sitting in the entrance of her tent. Good Lord! said Colonel Carberry, suddenly sitting up very straight. Are you suggesting I am suggesting that having ascertained just what Miss Pierce, the only witness likely to be awake, was doing, Lady Westholm returned to her tent, put on her riding breeches, boots and cocky-coloured coat, 
made herself an Arab headdress with her checked duster and a skein of knitting wool and that, thus attired, she went boldly up to drive. Gerard's tent, looked in his medicine chest, selected a suitable drug, took the hypodermic, filled it and went boldly up to her victim. MRS. Boynton may have been dozing. Lady Westholm was quick. She caught her by the wrist and injected the stuff. MRS. Boynton half cried out tried to rise then sank back. The Arab hurried away with every evidence of being ashamed and abashed. MRS. Boynton shook her stick, tried to rise, then fell back into her chair. Five minutes later Lady Westholm rejoins Miss Pierce and comments on the scene she has just witnessed, impressing her own version of it on the other. Then they go for a walk, pausing below the ledge where Lady Westholm shouts up to the old lady. She receives no answer for MRS. Boynton is dead but she remarks to Miss Pierce. Very rude just to snort at us like that. Miss Pierce accepts the suggestion. She has often heard MRS. Boynton receive a remark with a snort she will swear quite sincerely if necessary that she actually heard it. Lady Westholm has sat on committees often enough with women of Miss Peary's type to know exactly how her own eminence and masterful personality can influence them. The only point where her plan went astray was the replacing of the syringe. Drive. Gerard returning so soon upset her scheme. She hoped he might not have noticed its absence, or might think he had overlooked it, and she put it back during the night. He stopped. Sarah said. But why? Why should Lady Westholm want to kill old MRS? Boynton. Did you not tell me that Lady Westholm had been quite near you in Jerusalem when you spoke to MRS? Boynton. It was to Lady Westholm that MRS. Boynton's words were addressed. I've never forgotten anything, not an action, not a name, not a face. Put that with the fact that MRS. Boynton had been a wardress in a prison and you can get a very shrewd idea of the truth. Lord Westholm met his wife on a voyage back from America. Lady Westholm, before her marriage, had been a criminal and had served a prison sentence. You see the terrible dilemma she was in? Her career, her ambitions, her social position all at stake. What the crime was for which she served a sentence in prison we do not yet know, though we soon shall, but it must have been one that would effectually blast her political career if it was made public. And remember this, MRS. Boynton was not an ordinary blackmailer. She did not want money. She wanted the pleasure of torturing her victim for a while and then she would have enjoyed revealing the truth in the most spectacular fashion. No, while MRS. Boynton lived Lady Westholm was not safe. She obeyed MRS. Boynton's instructions to meet her at Petra, I thought it strange all along that a woman with such a sense of her own importance as Lady Westholm should have preferred to travel as a mere tourist but in her own mind she was doubtless revolving ways and means of murder. She saw her chance and carried it out boldly. She only made two slips. One was to say a little too much the description of the torn breeches which first drew my attention to her, and the other was when she mistook drive. Gerard's tent and looked first into the one where Ginevra was lying half asleep. Hence the girl's story half make-believe half true of a chic in disguise. She put it the wrong way around, obeying her instinct to distort the truth by making it more dramatic, but the indication was quite significant enough for me. He paused. But we shall soon know. I obtained Lady Westholm's fingerprints today without her being aware of the fact. If these are sent to the prison where MRS. Boynton was once a ward res, we shall soon know the truth when they are compared with the files. He stopped. In the momentary stillness a sharp sound was heard. What's that? Asked Drive. Gerard. Sounded like a shot to me, said Colonel Carberry, rising to his feet quickly. 
in the next room. Who's got that room, by the way? Poirot murmured. I have a little idea it is the room of Lady Westholm. Epilogue extract from the evening shout. We regret to announce the death of Lady Westholm, MP, the result of a tragic accident. Lady Westholm, who was fond of traveling in out-of-the-way countries, always took a small revolver with her. She was cleaning this when it went off accidentally and killed her. Death was instantaneous. The deepest sympathy will be felt for Lord Westholm, etc. etc. On a warm June evening five years later Sarah Boynton and her husband sat in the stalls of a London theatre. The play was Hamlet. Sarah gripped Raymond's arm as Ophelia's words came floating over the footlights. How should I your true love know from another one? By his cockle hat and staff, and his sandal shun. He is dead and gone, lady, he is dead and gone, at his head a grass-green turf, at his heels a stone. Oh, ho! Oh. A lump rose in Sarah's throat. That exquisite, witless beauty, that lovely, unearthly smile of one gone beyond trouble and grief to a region where only a floating mirage was truth. Sarah said to herself. She's lovely lovely. That haunting, lilting voice, always beautiful in tone, but now disciplined and modulated to be the perfect instrument. Sarah said with decision, as the curtain fell at the end of the act. Ginny's a great actress a great great actress. Later, they sat around a supper table at the Savoy. Ginevra, smiling, remote, turned to the bearded man by her side. I was good, wasn't I, Theodore? You were wonderful, Cherie. A happy smile floated on her lips. She murmured. You always believed in me you always knew I could do great things sway multitudes. At a table not far away, the hamlet of the evening was saying gloomily. Her mannerisms. Of course people like it just at first but what I say is, it's not Shakespeare. Did you see how she ruined my exit? Nadine, sitting opposite Ginevra, said. How exciting it is, to be here in London with Ginny acting Ophelia and being so famous. Ginevra said softly. It was nice of you to come over. A regular family party, said Nadine, smiling, as she looked around. Then she said to Lennox. I think the children might go to the matinee, don't you? They're quite old enough, and they do so want to see Aunt Ginny on the stage. Lennox, a sane, happy-looking Lennox with humorous eyes, lifted his glass. To the newlyweds, M.R. and M.R.S. Cope. Jefferson Cope and Carol acknowledged the toast. The unfaithful swain. Said Carol laughing. Jeff, you'd better drink to your first love as she's sitting right opposite you. Raymond said gaily. Jeff's blushing. He doesn't like being reminded of the old days. His face clouded suddenly. Sarah touched his hand with hers, and the cloud lifted. He looked at her and grinned. Seems just like a bad dream. A dapper figure stopped by their table. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.